called Paul versus the Temple of Venus. And um, some interesting, something interesting happens to the Apostle Paul as he wasn't knee deep in, the, in dealing with the idolatry of the people of Athens for very long that, he, that Paul takes a stroll about 40 to 50 miles down the road or by sea. We're not sure exactly, but uh, or by water or by, uh, by walking. He takes a 40 to 50 mile uh, trip and he walks into the city of Corinth. And this would end up being a place that the Apostle Paul would be for 18 months. The Lord would keep him there. That's a long time for a man that's moving like Paul was. But God kept him there. But I think, like I always, I like to do when, we, when Paul goes to another city here, I like to talk a little bit about that city. Because I think if you get some background, you can understand uh, contextually what's going on and why Paul's saying some of the things he does. When you put this together, then what you're going to figure out is, oh, now I understand why he dealt with the Corinthians that way. Now I understand why he said some of the things that he said and how he handled himself there and how he dealt with these people. So we're going to go through that and I'm going to explain to you what was going on in Corinth, what Paul faced. Remember we talked about Athens when he walked into Athens and there was 10,000 idols everywhere. You have the big theaters everywhere. Well, when he walks into Corinth in the middle of the city, there is a humongous temple to the goddess Venus. And that temple had 1,000 prostitutes. And those 1,000 prostitutes would go out into the city and all, of, and, and, and I'm going to explain to you what the city was like so you get that. Because this is what, you got to understand what Paul is facing here. You know, what, what the, the city is full of, what it's dominated by. There's a spirit that hovered over that city. And it was that temple of Venus. It was that spirit that hovered over there. And that would be what Paul, like in Athens, he dealt with philosophy. He dealt with the philosophers. They worshiped their own intellect, their mind. Well, here, the main thing that Paul is going to be dealing with is fornication. The city is completely gripped. Could you imagine a thousand prostitutes at night that were sent out across the city to fornicate? That's what they were sent to do. This is where Paul finds himself as he walks into this Gentile city, right? And he sees, and he walks, imagine he's walking in there and he gets to the heart of that and there's this very large temple. And I guess if you wanted to, you could, you could sort of liken it to Vegas maybe. And if a, if a preacher like Paul would walk into Vegas and he would see the legalized prostitution, and he would see the things that were going on, and he would see Sin City, right? So we're going to look at some scripture and see what Paul, like what he dealt with, and, 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 and look at the, the book of Corinthians a little bit, because he keeps hitting something over and over again in Corinthians. And now you know why. It wasn't just happenstance. Like he didn't, yes, he was led by the Spirit of God, but he was led by the Spirit of God by what he saw around him. That like, because the Gentiles did not follow what the Jews did. Now, yes, the Jews had to deal with fornication, adultery, and things of that nature. They had a law against that. When you got to Gentile countries, there was no law against that. There was, listen, Christianity uplifted the woman to a place of respect and honor. When you understand 1 Corinthians 7 and what Paul is saying, Christianity is what lifted up woman to a place of honor so she was respected. So a guy just didn't use her and abuse her according to their religious dictates. 
But according to the scriptures, the wife was supposed to be honored as the weaker vessel. And men were to abstain from fornication. That wasn't taught in the world. That wasn't taught. Fornication was absolutely, and I'll get to that, but it was absolutely normalized. It was a normal part of life, much like it is in America today. Like, you know, it's funny when you talk to people, they'll, they'll actually, when you talk to them, they actually are, are like, well, I mean, what's the big deal about that? They've moved way past fornication now, and they're, they're, they're getting into bestiality and everything else you can imagine, pedophilia and everything else you can imagine. I mean, they, what's, what's the big deal about that? Well, that's what Paul did when he walked into that city and he saw the Temple of Venus there. And he saw the spirit that hovered over that and what was dealing, what the whole, what the whole uh, city was about. And then, and then we'll kind of explain a few things there about that city at that time. Because, listen, a gospel preacher is not immune to what goes on around him. He sees the things that are uh, going on in the city that he preaches in or the places that he goes uh, and, and, and the idolatry and the adultery and, the, and, and just at, we're, we're, we see it, right? Much like, you know, when you see a man with long hair and you would say something, right? Why? Well, because you're not immune to the fact that that's against God's law and even nature teaches. Right? So you're not immune to that. You're not going to act like that doesn't affect your preaching any. Or when you see sodomite or effeminate men, it's, it's going to be a part of your preaching just like it was the Apostle Paul. Father in heaven, Lord, bless us now, we pray. Help us to understand this city and the disaster and the danger that was there, but also, Lord, the rewards of preaching the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, Paul leaves Athens, right? Another city, another challenge. No two places are alike. You know, you can preach. The, it's funny because there's some similarities with sinners, but when we preach in Northfield, it's way different than when we preach in Owatonna. Yeah, they're all sinners. We're not saying that. There's no sanctified sinner, right? But the point is, is that you can tell the difference. What, like in this city... They are very intellectual. They think they're better than you. They, they, they really do think they're smarter than you. And they're like Athens. They're, they're a lot like Athens, right? When you go to other cities, you're going to deal with a different spirit that's more seedy and dark. Um, sometimes easier to understand, though, from that standpoint. They're not as sneaky. They're just pretty open with what they believe and what they hold to. But the city of Corinth, when Paul comes to Corinth in 1 Corinthians 2, 1, he says this. And I, brethren, when I came to you. So Paul is reflecting in 1 Corinthians. He's reflecting back to this time when he walks into the city. And here's what he says. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So Paul's reflecting when he first comes to Corinth, he's reflecting back on this Acts 18 moment, and he's saying, look, this is what I, when I came to you, I just came preaching Christ and him crucified to you. I didn't, I didn't, you know, deal with any intellectual things like I did in Athens or anything like that. Uh, no, I just came straight forward. I saw the city. I saw what was going on, and I preached Christ and him crucified, right? And he said, I was with you in weakness and in fear. Some think that he might, may have been sick even, that he, may have, that he may have been sick at that time. Who knows? Spiritually afflicted, obviously. But he said, my speech and my preaching, it was not with enticing words. He was very plain. Very straightforward. Like they didn't, they weren't confused as to what Paul was saying. It was very clear, which is how a gospel preacher ought to be. It's very clear, very straightforward, right? Very easy to understand. Why? Because he wanted their faith that it would not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Amen. 
You know, I think of Northfield. There are many sinners in Northfield, but when you preach here, there, there are diversities, and some of that has to do with the things that have went on in this city, right? Some of the things that went on in this city. Um, now, we understand that in whatever city you're in, whatever place you're in, the solution is always Jesus Christ. He is the solution, right? He is the answer for everything. When we preach, we, we don't preach a system, we preach a person. I'm going to say that again to you. When we preach, we don't preach a system, we preach a person. We preach Jesus Christ and him crucified, the power of God unto salvation. We preach Jesus, that's who we preach. Always we must preach Christ, always. We do not preach a legalized system of, of, of anything, we preach the man Christ Jesus. We preach the God-man. We preach the Son of God. We preach the Messiah, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Very often when I'm out on the street, I preach those titles of Christ and those names of Christ to those people over and over again. Why? Because I'm telling them of Christ and who he is. I, I, I keep drilling that in. He is the Lamb of God. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the Son of man. He is the Son of God. He is the Son of the Most High. He is the son of righteousness with healing in his wings, right? That's who he is. That's who Jesus is. And, and we continue on. And, and, and that's what Paul said. He came very simply. And he gave them very simple answers. Now, I'm going to read you a lot of background of the city. So bear with me as I read through some of it tonight. But I, wa I want you to get a good feel for it. Because actually with Corinth, there was actually two Corinths. Before, Corinth was destroyed. And it, the, the, the Romans came in and demolished it. Well, then they came back in and they rebuilt it again. And they built it into a huge commerce, a huge city, a huge trafficking area. Uh -huh. And it trafficked a lot of things. We'll get to. Corinth was destroyed by the Romans in 146 B.C. and was rebuilt by Julius Caesar in 46 B.C. A colony of free Romans was planted there, and it became the capital of the Roman province of Achaia. In Paul's day, Corinth was a center of commerce that was famous for its wealth. It was a very wealthy city. Very wealthy. Had lots of money, lots of trafficking. When you have lots of money, it had two ports. So when you have lots of, when you have a lot of, when you have those, those, um, uh, port cities like that, and you have two ports, and then you have what's, what they're trafficking in there with the Temple of Venus in there. Look, if you traffic women, you're going to draw a lot of attention, and that's exactly what they did. Uh, let's see. Corinth was a center of commerce. It was famous for its wealth. It was strategically located a, as a commercial bridge between Asia and Italy. It had harbors facing two seas, one east and one west. Now, I'm going to read, I'll get a little deeper into this in a second, but Corinth was also famous for its idolatry and immorality. Venus, the Roman goddess of sensual love, was worshipped. Known as Aphrodite to the Greeks, she was worshipped with, with shameful licentiousness. The Venus temple at Corinth had 1,000 harlots who served in honor of the goddess, tempting men far and wide with the promise of sensual pleasures. As with Babylon of old, the very name Corinth was a synonym for immorality. That word, Corinthiazomia, it meant, referred to fornication. That's what the word meant. So does any wonder that over and over again, Paul deals with fornication when he's dealing with the Corinthians? This will make sense to you in a little while when we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and we talk about some of these other things. In the particular, this city was known for its fornication. It was even, that was the nickname of it. The insinuation of it was there when people came into the city. It's like Sin City, right? When you think of Las Vegas, and no one questions whether what goes on in Sin City, right? I mean, they, they know. They, they don't question that. They know exactly what's going to go on there. And that's the same thing there. The Corinth of which we read in the New Testament was quite a new city. Uh, this is from Strong's and McClintock. I believe. Having been rebuilt and established as a Roman colony and people with freed men from Rome by the dictator Caesar. We talked about that right before his assassination. Although the soil was too rocky to be fertile and the territory very limited, Corinth again became a great and wealthy city in a short time. 
especially as the Roman proconsuls made it the seat of government for southern Greece, which was now called the province of Achaia. In earlier times, Corinth had been celebrated for the great wealth of its temple of Venus, which had gainful traffic of a most dishonorable kind with the numerous merchant residents there, supplying them with harlots under the forms of religion. This is the, and I'm going to get to that, but this is that mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. When you understand, and it's Astarte, it's, it's Ashtaroth, it's whoever you want to call it, it's the, it's the, uh, the male female, right? It's, it, it's, it's the sons of God, daughters of men worship. And it was prevalent. It is in, modern, in the modern vernacular, you would call it a sex cult, right? Which, by the way, I could give you like three of them right now. Mormons. Yep. That. Don't tell me you're not a sex cult when you have celestial underwear. Right? Don't tell me that. I'm not stupid. I know exactly. Uh, I, I know exactly what that means. And plus, you just study what they believe, and they're yeah. obsessed with it. Yeah. They're obsessed with it. Right? Okay. But is that the only one? No, Roman Catholicism. What do you have? You have an outward form of celibacy, but then you have a practice of pedophilia worldwide. Amen. Yeah. Worldwide. Yeah. Everywhere. In fact, when we, were, when we were out preaching on Sunday night, this young lady was butched her hair, shaved it all down. She was very hard. And nothing was getting through to her when you talked to her. It was just like bouncing off a wall and brazen and everything else. And I, I, I don't know, I could just tell. And she said it. She said she hated men and God's some white man, so she hates God too. And, and, uh, and then finally at the end when we're all done and we try to talk to her, and I said, well, guys, let's just go. And, and we were leaving. You know, she said that uh, David made a comment to her that, you know, when you're by yourself, you, you act like you're joyous and dancing and laughing, but you're probably a very depressed person when you're by yourself. And she goes, that's right, I am. And she said, I take, she said, I, uh, that's why I smoke a lot of dope, a lot of pot. That's why I smoke a lot of pot. She said, uh, it's a prescription. I said, well, what do you need a prescription for that for? She goes, for PTSD. Because of a Catholic priest. And then everything she had said to me before and everything she said to everybody else made perfect sense. Because everything that we were saying to her, we were just her abusers talking to her because that's how she viewed us. That nothing we said was going to make a whole lot of sense to her. Or was she was going to accept why because someone had already hardened her that's a cult that's a sex cult that's what rome is now not all the people that are in it don't misunderstand me it's not all the people that go to catholic churches and everything like that no it's the papacy it's the dark priesthood it's the dark priesthood that's what it is it's 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 that Baal worship whatever spirit hovers over them that's the one that controls them and we'll get to that in a second. Okay, we find Gallio, the brother of the philosopher Seneca, exercising the functions of a proconsul there in Corinth at that time. The residence continued for a year and six months. Paul did there. He stayed there for a while, and uh, the Lord had him build a church there. The apostles had recently passed through Macedonia in Acts chapter 18. He came to Corinth from Athens shortly after his arrival. Silas and Timotheus came from Macedonia and rejoined him. And about this time, the two epistles to the Thessalonians were written. So all of this is in a timeline succession of things that are happening at that time. Uh, he goes on to say, Corinth was a place of great mental activity as well as of commercial and manufacturing enterprise. Its wealth was so celebrated as to be proverbial. So were the vice of the, its inhabitants, the vices of its inhabitants. The worship of Venus here was attended with shameful licentiousness. All these points are indirectly illustrated by passages in the two epistles, which we'll talk, to, uh, talk about in, 
in Corinthians. Now, during his visit there, the epistle to the Romans was written also. From three epistles last mentioned, uh, we find that later on in the book of Acts, which we can look at some other time. We gather that Paul was much occupied at this time with the collection for the poor Christians at Jerusalem. Remember, he talked about that when he was there. That's what he wanted to do in Corinthians. Um, we, we saw that there. According to Philo, it was, it was extensively colonized by the Jews. Uh, so there, were, there was a Jewish presence there. And now, remember, those Jews were merchants. and They knew how to make money. So where are they going to be? They're going to be at a port city like that. They're going to have a synagogue there. And, you know, Paul's going to be around there. And that's definitely going to be interesting, right? Um, there was a party spirit also there in the church later that, that when Paul established it, remember they talked about Paul and Peter and of Apollos, and some said they were, they were really spiritual, they were of Christ, and, they, and, and they, they really started their factions and their warring and their fighting, and, and Paul said he baptized none but Crispus and Gaius, and, and, and he, he mentioned the people that he, that, you know, that he, that he baptized there. Um, Kiddo, this man right here, he was a blind man. Boy, he was an interesting man. Kiddo, Kiddo's Daily Bible Illustrations. It's, there it is right there. Kiddo's, this guy, he wrote some really interesting devotions. But um, anyway, in his, in his uh, pictorial Bible, which I have somewhere, anyway, um, in that, um, he says this, This great and wealthy city was the metro metropolis of Achaia and situated upon the isthmus of the same name, which joins... Uh, Peloponnesus is to the continent. Its position was highly favorable to that of commerce, which ultimately rendered it one of the most luxurious cities of the world. So you got the Apostle Paul that walks into this city, right? And it is a decadent place. It's like walking into America, walking into New York, or walking into, you know, someplace in New York Harbor where they, you know, how those Christians sang that, that Statue of Liberty song. There stands a lady with her torch raised to the sky. That was not the Temple of Venus. That was not. Right? Don't sing it, Jacob. I know you want to. That's right. That's right. So it's not new to have idols in harbors like that, in, temp in harbor cities. It's really, it's not new. Or for it to be androgynous. Because they say that the Temple of Venus and the worship there was androgynous. Well, that's a little uncomfortable. Bit of history. That'll I'm just saying. I mean, look at honestly, look at the Statue of Liberty. Like, what does that have to do with America? If you look at that right there, and you look at that thing with that torch hanging to the sky and the androgynous looking everything like that, you can see automatically you're like, man, what is that thing? What in the world? And why did we even take that stupid thing? I'll tell you why we took it. Because that was the spirit that was over it. That was a picture. That was an idol. It was a picture of that. Yep. Just like back here. You should have seen how mad I made people when I first preached on that. Woo-wee! Not Lee, though. He wasn't mad. Yeah. It's androgynous. Yeah. That's what it's supposed to be. Okay, so let's see. In the center of this, uh, let's see, let me back up. For having two ports, one of which was open to the eastern and the other the western navigator, while its geographical situation placed it, as it were, in the center of the civilized world. It became the point where the merchants from every quarter of the globe met and exchanged their treasures. It was also celebrated for the Ist Isthmian Games, to which the apostle makes... Some striking and remarkably appropriate allusions in his epistle to the Corinthians. So remember when he talks about the sporting events and he talks about different things in, in 1 Corinthians? Well, it's not because Paul was like playing. <laughs> Paul wasn't in the Isthmian games. He wasn't like, yeah, I'm a part of it. It's cool. No, he was like using it as illustrations because yeah, yeah, the people yeah. that he was talking to would know what he was talking about, right? Uh, right. He was just <laughs> He's the apostle to the sports world. Uh, That's right. Yeah. Amen. Nor should it be unnoticed that in the center of the city there stood a famous temple of Venus in which a thousand priestesses of the goddess ministered 
To thy sententious, we already talked about that. Under the guise of religion from such various causes, Corinth had an influx of foreigners of all descriptions who carried the productions and the vices of all nations into a city in which the merchant, the warrior, and the seaman could have them for money. So I want you to think about this for a second. Why does this matter to us? Well, it does. Here's this city, right, that's manufacturing wickedness all over the world. And where does God send a preacher to? Right to that city. Right in the heart of that city. And says, I'm going to send you right in there. And later on, he comes to Paul and he says, Paul, you ain't going nowhere. He goes, I have many people in this city, Paul. You are not leaving. You're going to stay here and you are going to preach. And that's what he did. See, that's what God does. God used those Roman roads. God used those Greek highways. God used those things to spread the gospel to the known world. Because Satan's like, well, I'm going to use this to export wickedness. And God's like, well, I'm going to send my preacher right up in the heart of that, right there. Right in the middle of it. I'm going to send him right there. That's what he did. He sent him right there. Could you imagine? Paul, I guarantee you, Paul's out, out around that temple of Venus, and he is preaching. He sees it in that city. He sees it right there. I mean, you can't miss it. It's right there. Devoted to traffic and to the enjoyment of the wealth which the traffic secured, the Corinthians were exempt from the influence of that thirst for conquest and military glory by which their neighbors were actuated. Hence, they were seldom engaged in any war except for the defense of their country or in behalf of the liberties of Greece. Yet this city furnished many brave and experienced commanders to other Grecia states, among whom it was common to prefer a Corinthian general to one of their own state. As might be expected, Corinth was not remarkably distinguished for philosophy or science, but its wealth attracted to it the arts which assisted to enrich and aggrandize till it became one of the very finest cities in all Greece. So this here's this amazing city, right, that Paul's in the middle of. The Corinthian order of architecture took its name from Therac and flowery style which prevailed in its sumptuous edifices, its temples, palaces, theaters, and porticos. Yet it is noteworthy that no specimen of this style of architecture has been found there. You know, over and over again, Paul warns the Corinthians and different people. There was a problem, if you remember right, a problem that came up in the Corinthian church. It was a very big one. And they were puffed up over it. And they had not rather mourned, right? That he which had done this thing might be taken away from you, right? It was fornication. The man had had his father's wife. He had taken his father's wife. He was in fornication. Look, I know this sounds crazy, but we live post 2,000 years after Christ rose from the dead, right? So we have a Bible, and we have, we have those things. Those people were brand-new Christians. And they're, they're suffering the fornicator in the church because, well, that's just what you did in Corinth. You were just fornicators. Well, Paul lays down the law, uh, the, the, the scriptural law, and he says, no, that ain't happening. You can't do that. And he explains to them why. Now, why? Who is this Venus, this god of love, this temple? What is it? What is it all about? The goddess of love, among, and what they mean by love is what most people in America, what do most people in America mean by love? Fornication. Right? Fornication, that's what they believe love is. Do you realize that Paul wrote on charity and love to those Corinthians? Why? Because the only love those people knew was fornication. That's all they knew. That, that's all they knew, those people. They had no concept of Christian marriage or even Jewish marriage. or They had no concept of it at all. This is what Paul's facing when he comes here. They were trained in that, do, in that goddess Venus. That was the god that ruled over them, Aphrodite among the Greeks. Later times confounded with the oriental deities, Ashtoreth, the popular myths concerning her origin are various. By some, she is represented as the daughter of Jupiter, but she was poetically said to have sprung from the foam of the sea. She became the wife of Vulcan, 
And no, that's not Spock. Just so you know. Vulcan. Remember those guys when we go over there to the, and we, remember those guys? Who remembers the Vulcans? Not Spock. But the, the, the guys when you go up to the, you remember those guys, right? They got their fire and they're going, and they're laughing at us and they hate the gospel and they get mad at us all the time. And they have like dragons and wick and really ugly, fiery, spooky things in the middle of the night, right? That they that they light up and and it's the god of fire. Vul well, that's Vulcan. That's that's who they serve. Right. That's who they serve. That's that's them. See, all this stuff has an origin. It has a place. It's Satan. Satan's the origin of all of it. But but that's it. Does have it, right? That's what they were facing here. But her armors with nearly all the gods and with every mortal were the scandals of heaven and earth. Basically, licentiousness. She is also, listen, as the creatures of the world called genetrix, the Venus Urania of the Romans and Greeks was sometimes depicted as androgynous and even in a manner still more offensive. And this symbolism seems to typify the fact that Venus was feminine but powerless if alone. When she was delineated with a mural crown, the idea embodied was that she became a mother by her own inherent power. Her frequent symbol was the crescent moon. Oh. Really? Also in Nineveh, in that, the queen of heaven. The scriptures in Jeremiah talk about the queen of heaven. You say... Pastor, really, is this is there really a spirit like this? Do they have devils that are that are real? Yes, there are. You know how we know? You face it every time. When you see androgynous men and women out there, when you see them dress like that, when you see the spirit what they have, when you see that they don't believe there's only two genders. They don't believe that. It's because they're androgynous. It's because devils are influencing them. They didn't get that on their own. They were taught that. Because the devil's always working, and that's why you and I need to be always working. Amen. Because he's, listen, our children, not ours maybe per se, but that's why we warn them, but others, the children of this era right now, they are taught every manner of filth, fornication, disgusting behavior, transgenderism, whatever it is, and it is a spirit. It is that mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. It is that androgynous queen of heaven spirit that rules over where? Rome, Islam, and every false religion. It's just what it is. And that's Paul faced the same thing when he went into Corinth. It's no different. As a female winged figure, partly naked and presiding over gener generations, she is introduced in embroideries of robes in the most ancient palace of Minerva. Oh, are you starting to get the impression that all these cultures that have these false gods and they all seem to resemble each other are actually picturing someone or something? Yeah. And they're not that much different. Remember back when I did that... Um, I want to say it was a PowerPoint, and I talked about those symbols, those occult symbols and different things like that, and it was Mary, Queen of Heaven, or it was the Queen of Heaven, then it was Mary, and then it was, um, uh, was it Isis, Horus, Set? Is that what it was? D just all the different pictures of those things in different cultures and those different gods, but they're all really the same gods that they're serving. Why? Because Satan doesn't care what flavor it is, as long as it's not Jesus Christ exclusively. He doesn't care what it is at all her worship of uh let's see rude images of this goddess is baked in clay and have been disinterred among the ruins of baghdad babylon her worship was of a general prevalence among the pagan nations of antiquity and meets us at two or three points of special biblical interest it was an impure form of the same worship which was presented its more scientific aspect in that of the temple of ephesus the personification of the same relation between the rites of Ephesus and Sardis. You have Diana of the Ephesians, or you have the Statue of Liberty, whichever. You, you can pick whichever you want. They're, they're both exactly the same. Like, or you have Wonder Woman in modern, in modern era. You have the androgynous Wonder Woman, right? You have that strong, right, right? And what is she? Half naked. I'm telling you, it's the same thing. And what's her name? Diana. Well, that wasn't an accident. 
I mean, you can't get any more specific than that, can you? That literally, from the time I was a child and I saw DC Comics and Marvel Comics, I had no idea that I was being indoctrinated into false gods. But that's what it is. Mainstream indoctrination. No different. Right? Same thing. Let's see. Okay. So now we look at the great whore on the hill. We look at Rome, right? Uh, what does Rome do? It chooses the every in most of the cities they go to, they try to get the highest place possible in the city, right? So when we go to St. Paul and you look up that hill, who's at the top of that hill up there? Castle Grayskull, yes. Um, that's what it looks like. What's that? Yeah. And and what remember the was that the place that had the um, what's the thing where they had the ramp going down? Crushed yeah, yeah that that event, right? Is it crashed or crushed? I like calling it crushed ice. Okay, Dave. <laughs> Dave isn't. They get better the older I get. Yeah, they do. That's true. Right. Right, and then is that. Was that where praise the loud is too, or is that a different? I I always confuse those. I always confuse those two temples of doom. I I, I can't keep them straight. Yeah, they're like temples of doom. They're just that's what they are, right? But what are they? They're a cult. The Babylonian Venus, according uh, to Harpocration, uh, it's it's the same thing. It's all the same spirit. Now, why do I say that? Well, turn to First Corinthians chapter seven. Because Paul, he starts to instruct these people later on uh, in, in this letter. Well, he's writing this in 1 Corinthians 7. Now concerning the things wherever you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now I want you to think about that for a second because here's the apostle Paul. And he's standing, why is he telling the Corinthians this? Well, because there's a thousand whores in the city, that's why, and they're everywhere, and they're roaming the streets everywhere, and they're basically selling themselves, they're basically selling themselves to everybody, provocative clothes, everything. Now, what's America like? I, it always amazes me that when do you ever hear preachers really preach straightforward about that? I'll tell you who you hear preach it, street preachers. When we go out there on the street, we preach against those sexual sins. We preach against that fornication, pornography, and all these other. You know what? My top hit sermons on Sermon Audio is my series on pornography. You know why? Because people are literally starving for preaching against it. And to be strengthened after they've been in it, and to repent, and to get it right. And to know and to be strengthened out of that and to grow right from that. And how do I move on, preacher, from that? And what happened to my mind and what did I go through and all those things? Those are the number one sermons. Those are the number one. Why is that? Because they are needed. And you know what? It's. Preachers don't want to preach on fornication. They don't want to preach on direct, oh, our children can't handle it. No, your children need to hear it. Your children need to hear that what the Bible says. Now, concerning the things you wherever you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. That's God's order. That's God's way. And your children need a preacher that stands up and tells them, you don't touch anybody until you're married. They need a preacher to stand up and tell them that. They need somebody to warn them about that, to preach, to preach that to them. They need a preacher to stand there fearlessly, straightforward, in their face, telling them what God says. Amen. They do need it. And you need to be talking to your children about that as they get older, too. You have a responsibility to talk to them. And those are uncomfortable conversations, and you're not going to like any of them. But grow up. 
You don't have to like it to be obedient. You got to be obedient. Amen. By the way, your comfortability in a matter does nothing to do with your obedience. One thing I've learned the hard way is you got to be obedient whether you're comfortable or not. <laughs> Amen. Doesn't matter. Right? And, 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 and preaching against that, by the way, that fornication covers all of it. Pornography, all of it. Covers all of it. Adultery, fornication, any of those sins. It covers all of them. That's why God used that word. Amen. In his perfect English. That's why he used that word. Covers it all. There's no wiggle room. Amen. But that's why Paul's dealing with that. Why? Because the whole city was taken with it. Could you imagine planting a church there where it's normal for them to have whores? Like it's normal for them to see thousands of whores roaming the streets? Like that's normal. And then you're teaching your dog. And, and by the way, those thousand whores are they're gaining numbers every year right so i mean those younger women that are coming up they're being sold into prostitution right and given over to prostitution right folks this is reality i don't know why this 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 is not to me this is not taboo to me what's taboo is shutting up and not saying anything that's what i think it is I think that's, I think hitting it right between the eyes and dealing with it straightforward is the only way to deal with it. It's the only way, and it needs to be done. Man, it needs to be done. I like to tell people out there when I'm preaching to them and people in here when I'm preaching to you that that's somebody's daughter, you pervert. Amen. That pornography, that, that whatever it is, those things, that's somebody's daughter. Amen. And half the time probably sold into something. You look at those girls and you think that, that that's what they, those girls don't want that. Those girls are sold into there. They're kidnapped into that. They're coerced into it. And their lives are destroyed by it. And God forbid that any of God's people should ever have anything to do with it. We should, we should preach it down. And we should warn against it. I had some guy leave this church because his wife wasn't comfortable with me preaching on that. Bye. See ya. You ain't shutting me up. Little Jezebel spirit. I don't care if you pa package it into a dress all the way down to your toes. It don't matter to me. I ain't shutting up. You ain't shutting me up till I'm dead. God Almighty shuts me up. Ain't nobody else going to do it. That's for sure. I'm going to keep preaching it like God called me to do it. That's the way it's got to be. We got to be that way, friend. We're in a, you're, you're in that city. You're in that nation right now of that temple of Venus where you're facing that same thing right now. That same problem is prevalent. And this world is after your sons and your daughters to defile them. And you. And you every turn they can get. Every turn they can get. Yeah. And they're mean. Yeah. And, and, and that's what like, I had a sodomite get so mad at me one time when I was at an event and I preached because I told them, I said, all you are is a recruiter. Because nobody's born that way. You're recruited into that lifestyle. Man, did he flip. He, he flipped his fake wig. I mean, he was... He, whoa. Anyway, so Paul is dealing with that because it was so prevalent in the society. Those cults were being built on fornication. They were rampant. So part of their worship of the gods was fornication. Paul mentions it many times in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He, he has to deal with the church, right? It is reported commonly. Commonly. That there is fornication among you. 
and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. He said, you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. That's church discipline right there. He wouldn't get right there to kick him out if he wouldn't repent. Amen. Not take him through a 12-step program, Reformers Unanimous or something, right? Not, not take him through that. No, you don't want to get right? You got to go. Amen. Why? Because Paul's, they're, they're in the middle of that city where all this is going on. And he says, it's reported commonly this is happening right there. This is where Paul's preaching. This gives you some context to exactly what Paul, when he says these things, why he says these things. And by the way, let me tell you something. I don't care if you're 20 years old or you're 80 years old. You're not immune to any of those lusts or temptations. You better guard your heart. That's what you better do. None of us are immune to that. You better get on your knees and you better beg God for help in that area. Amen. You don't have to say amen. I know it. Remember, there are many Gentile believers in this church that they have no clue what a proper marriage is. That's why Paul's explaining that in 1 Corinthians 7. Because all they knew was open relationships. You know what the Greek society was like? I mean, you, you get it, right? You could pretty much tell by their architecture what they were like, right? Naked statues everywhere. I mean, you, I mean, it's like going into... What baffles me is that people go into Roman Catholic churches where there's naked things everywhere, and they're surprised that they're perverts. Really? Like, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm sorry. Like, you don't walk into my house, and I don't have paintings of naked people on the walls. That would tend to maybe give it away a little bit that there might be something wrong with you. Right? Right? It's like going in, it's like some guy next door has, which they don't use these anymore probably for the most part, but Playboy magazines or something back. You, 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 those magazines, right, or pornography magazines, uh, you know, like you would be like, I don't want that guy around my kid. I don't want that guy around any. I don't want that guy. Or you found out he was looking at pornography. Well, what do you think they have on their walls with all their statues and everything? I mean, doesn't dawn on you that'd be a bad place to go? Like a bad place to send your kids, especially to a guy that doesn't like women? I, I never could understand that. Like, why would you ever send somebody to, con to confession like that and to do that to a guy that openly says, well, I'm never getting married? That wouldn't be like a big shock to you? That it's contrary to the scriptures and everything else for him to, to force celibacy like that and to do that? And, and, and no normal desires of a man like that? By the way, we should remember, too, that most people today in America have no clue about proper marriage and abstaining from fornication and walking in purity. They have no clue what that means. And that's why they look at you like you are insane. When you preach against uh, fornication and it's not good for a man to touch a woman and you preach all those, they look at you like you're nuts. What are you talking about? Right? Like they can't imagine doing anything wrong. Like if they have four or five girlfriends or cheating on their wife, or like what's the big deal? There's a spirit that hangs over that, right? In Athens, it was intellectual idolatry that ruled over them. Here in Corinth, it was the battle that plagued them was fornication. It was mainstream. It was popular. It's what this whole city was filled with. Men and women in society given over to it. <coughs> By the way, it was also a major port city where so many would traffic in the accursed thing. It reminds you of Revelation 18 and Babylon. It's the same spirit. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have, have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich to the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to her works, in the cup which she hath filled fill to her double how much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously so much torment and sorrow give her for she saith in her heart i sit a queen and am no widow 
and shall see no sorrow. Therefore, by the way, if you contrast that with Proverbs chapter 7 and the, and the strange woman, it's the same exact thing. By the way, you watch that, fornicate, that, that spiritual fornication in Rome, and then you watch a Proverbs 7 woman, you watch a strange woman like that, same way. They'll look at you, they'll wipe their mouth and say they've done nothing wrong. They are the same way. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judgeth her, and the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. That's the end of the world, friend. That's what God's going to do when he ends this thing. But I'm going to tell you something right now. You have cities all over the country that are like this, and America is just like a haven of it. We export, yes, we export the gospel all over the world, but we also export all kinds of wickedness all over the world. Our last president, I'm going to make you mad. Our last president forced other nations to decriminalize homosexuality across the world. He forced them to. He sent his sodomite ambassador to go to those other nations and lean on them and make them decriminalize homosexuality. Now, whether you agree or, or whatever, it doesn't matter. The point is, here's supposed to be a man that was supposed to be a Christian man, right? And he pushed that sodomite agenda all over the world. And they bragged about it. They bragged about it. Remember at the Republican National Convention? I love going back to that video. Man, does that make me a lot of friends. I feel the love when I play that video. Right? When you go back there and he, and, and he claps and he says, he said that we are going to protect the LGBTQ. And he goes, I'm so glad to hear the, all those applause at this Republican National Convention. And I'm like, okay. Right? But he did do what he said he was going to do. He decriminalized it in all those other countries. He, he forced them to do it. It wasn't enough that we had wickedness. He had to put it everywhere else, too. You know, here's the thing. God will use this city of Corinth and the trafficking to get him glory and spread the gospel. That's why he sent Paul there. But that's what Paul was up against. That's what he saw when he walked into that city. There's no city so wicked that God cannot plant a church there, though. You know that? That God cannot save men there. God can save men in any city, in any place in this world. There's no one beyond God's reach. Absolutely not. I think about this city and how they preach love, but what they really mean is fornication. What they really mean is do without wilt. That's what they really mean. They don't love, not like the Bible says. They hate. What they mean is lasciviousness. You know, Paul would later go on to the Corinthians and he would explain to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Luke and I have been talking about that, that, that he would explain to them what true charity, what true love is. So I think, what do you see there? This is, this is for something for you to kind of file away into your thought process and into your studies. Understand that people that bit, have been totally indoctrinated and, and exposed to fornication and those kind of things, and they've given themselves over to that, they have to learn what real love is. Because they don't know. When the only, thing, the only thing that they've ever known is that, they don't know what real love is. So what does Paul do to those Corinthians? He uses that city that sold the world's love, right, of fornication. Else. He uses that to teach them what real biblical love is is right that's what he does you read first corinthians chapter 13 and spiritual gifts and all those other things in first corinthians 12 and you read that and you'll get an understanding of what paul was doing there because that's that's why he had to show them because people that have only known that lifestyle that running around in that lifestyle that's the lifestyle i got saved out of so 
that lifestyle, I that you have to learn to love. You learn to build relationships and you learn to love people properly, biblically, right? You learn to look at the opposite sex in a biblical way. What did Paul say? As sisters, right? That treat the younger as sisters, right? You look at them as sisters. You learn to do that. That's why Paul was saying that. You learn to have proper relationships, right? Because they're foreign to you, especially if you were never loved yourself. Something to think about, isn't it? And lastly, what it does encourage us to think about as Paul goes into Corinth is that we always must have the mindset of pressing on. I know I've talked about this recently more and more, but we have to always remember to keep pressing on, to keep moving forward. Not to be looking back, but to be moving forward. Always moving forward, always pressing on, always always heading in the right direction. That is the per perfection in the Christian life is to press on. That is perfection. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. I believe that's what it is. I'll just to remind you of this. Here it goes in verse number um, 10. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. So I'm not there yet. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind. Forgetting the old life. Forgetting those things which are behind. And even yesterday and pressing on. Right? Not forgetting to learn lessons from my mistakes, my failures, my sins, and, and, and those things. But not dwelling on them. Amen. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. And, and if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. If you're looking back, you're not running. Because you can't run looking behind you. You can't do that. It doesn't work. You'll fall right on your face. You can't run looking behind you. You got to press on, right? To be to press on, to press on means on to perfection. Perfection is Christ. We press toward the mark. We continue to move. Psalm 118:24. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. So we're pressing. Paul left Athens. He took some converts with him. But he left Athens and he kept moving. He kept going forward. He, kept, he didn't let, let things discourage him or keep him down. He kept pressing forward. And that's what you and I have to do in this gospel work. We have to keep pressing forward in life, in raising our families, in all those things. We have to press forward. We have to press on and we have to continue on. There's a battle and a war. And every day is going to be different. But your duty is onward, Christian soldier. It's forward, not backward. Forward. Father, Lord, thank you. We thank you for your word. Thank you for its truths, for its power to encourage our hearts, to strengthen us, to edify us, to build us, to correct us. Thank you, Lord, for it. Thank you for these people, your people, Lord. Help us to possess our vessels with honor. Help us to flee fornication, to flee those things. Help us to teach our young people to flee those things. That God has something better for them. That they'll wait on Him, serve Him, be faithful to Him, and that You will bless them. Thank You, Lord. 
In Jesus' name we pray, amen.